What's the latest here and, and, and just how big is this fire going to get? Hi, Emily. Thanks for having me on. Yes. Yeah, so the uh, as of this morning, the uh, fire was about three miles south of South Lake Tahoe, which is um, the resort town that uh, borders the southern edge of the lake. And uh, uh, fire officials I spoke to this morning uh, were quite concerned that uh, uh, that the fire could spread into the city today. There is a forecast for very gusty winds and uh, dry conditions. And that forecast extends through tomorrow. So they've got a real battle on their hands. The main concern here is that the uh, winds could uh, blow embers uh, into the city and start uh, spot fires that could then turn into their own uh, blazes and then burn through the town. But so far, there are no, uh, th there is no report of any fire burning in South Lake Tahoe City itself. So at this point, what's the likelihood the fire will get to South Lake Tahoe? I mean, that, of course, is the main concern. Yes, it is. And uh, it's hard, you know, Cal Fire officials um, have not been able to say or give, a, give a, you know, an estimate of their ability to keep the fire out. Um, they have a whole army of crews uh, stationed throughout the city and throughout the southern part of the resort area trying to keep the flames at bay. So it's very much touch and go, um, and it's kind of a wait-and-see situation. So far today, they've been able to keep the fire out of the outskirts of the city where there are um, houses and cabins, so that's been a good sign. All right, Mark Chediak uh, reporting on what's happening at the front lines today. Mark, thank you so much for that update. Now, one of the biggest issues facing firefighters is knowing where the flames will head next. The Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory has developed a system that incorporates satellite imaging, artificial intelligence, and machine learning to detect wildfires early and predict the path they will take. For more, I'm joined by Neil Oman, Senior Technical Advisor of Data Science and also the Product Manager for Radar Fire, this new technologically advanced system. So, Neil, thank you so much for joining us. As I understand it, traditionally, firefighters are flying over blazes at night, drawing maps of where the flames are, and then using that in the morning to determine where to fight the fire. How would your technology change that process? Yeah, so, so Emily, you're correct that, that today the, there's an interagency fire center um, that dispatches planes to gather these infrared images overnight, and they do human analyst drawings, and they, they feed, you know, not, not so much hand-drawn, but computer-aided drawn maps to incident commanders. Um, and the, the, just the challenge is always for incident commanders is to know where is the fire right now, right, and where is it going in the next hour to two hours or three hours. And almost as importantly, you heard Mark mention spot fires. Where are the spot fires, and how fast can I know that, it's, that spot fires are jumping out of the fire? Fire into the, into you know it, it, whether it's into infrastructure or just into another part of the forest. Right, the faster I can get to those spot fires, the the, the more I can handle the damage. Right, so that what we've tried to do here is take higher resolution with this with this system, which is in a prototype production state and is starting to be used by the Forest Service in uh, for some of their uh, selected and more advanced incident commanders, is. Take satellite imagery from a variety of, of satellites, public access, open access satellites, uh, that's higher resolution than, than most of the geosynchronous satellites in use for uh, in use for weather and what have you today, and feed and, and feed that the data coming from those satellites into some algorithms, into some machine learning trained models that pulls out where is the fire right now. It gets better, faster, higher frequency observation of where the fire is. And in the future, use that information also, that higher frequency input information to uh, predict where it might go, including additional information about weather, wind, as, as Mark said, and other features, okay. fuel conditions, and what have you. So in the future, could you tell us, thanks to this technology, with relatively great certainty, whether the fire will get to Lake Tahoe or not? Uh, so within a certain time envelope, likely, likely that within it's a little bit like predicting the weather, right? So the weather predictions today are pretty good for eight to it, it, let's say 72 hours out. Beyond that, it's a little bit speculative. Same problem here, right? So predicting where the fire is going to go for the next couple, three, four, maybe eight, ten hours, 
probably very possible within a decent bound of certainty. Beyond that, it's harder to say. But that still gives people, uh, potentially gives people a much a better warning as to, hey, you know, this fire really is going to get to your city, your city boundary. You either need to set up a protective line or think about evacuations quicker. Now, when you're looking at the map of just California, I mean, there are like something like 100 fires happening at any given time. Of course, we're dealing with, with climate change. That's the huge challenge. But when it comes to resources, um, why can't we seem to get these fires under control fast enough? Well, so, I mean, so that's clearly the challenge, right? Regardless of the cause, the scale of the firefighting problem now, in, in the last several years, actually, has dramatically increased. And they just don't have the resources in terms of both aircraft to fly fires or re firefighters to fight them to get to them all, necessarily. So the question is, is, is can we scale the observational capabilities and the predictive capabilities up? And this system is it aims at doing that so that we can take a look at the whole western United States using these satellites, which don't have, you know, I don't have to put aircraft in the air. Uh, they're already up there. They're bringing data as, as you know, as, as often as they fly over, and that's an important aspect. As often as they fly okay. over, we can get data from them for, for spotting these fires and uh, showing, giving the ground crews information about where they are and potentially where they're going to go. Now, this technology is being used in actually all kinds of natural disasters from floods to hurricanes and, in fact, is being used right now in the response to Hurricane Ida to, as I understand it, assess the damage. How exactly is it helping there? Yeah, that, that's correct. So, so I work with a team of researchers led by uh, a person by the name of Andre Coleman, who they are right now, you would be talking to Andre probably, um, since I'm the project manager and he's the principal investigator, he, they are currently involved in extracting similar information for flood, flood extent, road closures, and more specifically, because of the, this is a Department of Energy program, uh, what is the damage to critical infrastructure? So there are a million people out of power in Louisiana at the moment, and the question is, is where is the, is the, the electrical grid damaged such that we can send crews there to fix, those, fix that damage, repair it as quickly as possible, get people back online? So right now they're taking similar kinds of satellite imagery. The storm has passed. Clouds are clear, starting to clear. Uh, you can take the satellite imagery, and you can do these kinds of damage assessment, critical infrastructure, uh, damage assessment and, and flood extent, what roads are closed, how do you get okay. to the damage infrastructure and what have you using the same technology in terms of that. I mean, different algorithms and different approaches, but roughly the same basic idea in terms of the technology.